Hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome Sasha Costanza Chalk as the WIST closing keynote speaker. Sasha is a researcher and a designer who works to support community led processes that build shared power, move towards collective liberation, and advance ecological survival. When Karen and I were just about to start focusing on finding a great keynote speaker for WIST, the pandemic happened and we had to redirect our focus on planning for the virtual conference. In the meantime, a number of societally transformational events took place and we had to pause and rethink whose voice is it important for us to hear at WIST where we are at the forefront of technological innovation because the societal grounding of the work that we do is something that we cannot ignore if we want to make real world impact. A colleague pointed us towards Sasha's work on network social movements, transformative media organizing and design justice. Thanks Mihala, if you're listening. And both of us were convinced right away that this is someone that the community must hear from. Sasha is a research scientist at MIT a senior research fellow at the Algorithmic Justice League and a faculty affiliate with the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Sasha is the author of two books and numerous journal articles, book chapters, and other research publications. Their new book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need, was published by the MIT Press in 2020. Sasha is a board member of Allied Media Projects and a member of the steering committee of the Design Justice Network. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Sasha to talk to the WIST community. Thank you so much, Shamsi, um, and to Karen and to WIST for inviting me. Um, please just let me know in the chat if you can hear me okay um, before I continue. And I'm gonna start up my screen. Okay, so um, if everything's good, I'm going to begin. Okay, so even though we're meeting virtually, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. I'm on the lands of the Wampanoag, Pawtucket, and Massachusetts peoples. We have a responsibility to acknowledge the history and ongoing violence of settler colonialism and to ask how we individually and institutionally can seek to end that violence and seek new paths forward. And for those of you who are watching, whose lens are you on? Uh, I encourage you, if you don't know, to visit uh, nativeland.ca, and then you can add your name and acknowledgement into um, the shared uh, chat space that we're using today. Although the lands that I'm on now and North America has been traversed by First Nations peoples for thousands of years, today they're fragmented by militarized borders. Yesterday, documents gathered by Tech Inquiry revealed a Google Cloud contract to work with Andrew Industries surveillance tech on the so-called virtual border wall. It's a partnership to develop cutting edge sensing classification AI decision support systems and augmented reality user interface design in partnership with Customs and Border Patrol and ICE. The agency is responsible for forced separation of thousands of children from their parents for extended periods of time, several hundred permanent separations where they've lost the records of the parents, deaths in custody, non-consensual invasive gynecological procedures, forced sterilization, and myriad other human rights abuses. So we live in very disturbing times. And yet in this talk, I'd like to focus on a sea change that I believe is taking place. On Wednesday, I watched the WIST and CSCW plenary panel chaired by Michael Bernstein that provided a retrospective of four decades of systems research in collaborative and social computing. That panel ended with Amy Jang and Nilafar Salehi presenting their findings from an informal survey of WIST participants about the future of the field. And they found that the values of democracy, agency, privacy, inclusivity, 
and sustainability are really important to members and that the largest area of concern is harms. There's a growing sense that the often unintended harms of computing systems require us to slow down, to reevaluate, to consider societal and long-term impacts, and sometimes even to refuse to participate in certain kinds of work. So today, I'm hoping to share some ideas from my new book, Design Justice, that I believe might be useful to that long-term project of making computing systems less harmful and of developing our capacity collectively to help build the worlds that we need. I'm gonna begin with a personal story um, that I used to open the book from June of 2017. I'm standing in a security line at the Detroit Metro Airport on my way back to Boston from the Allied Media Conference, which is a collaborative laboratory of media-based organizing that's been held every year in Detroit for the past two decades. At the AMC, over 3,000 people, media makers, designers, activists, and organizers, software developers and artists, filmmakers and researchers, gather every year to share ideas and strategies for how to create a more just, creative, and collaborative world. And as a non-binary, trans, femme-presenting person, my time there is always deeply liberating. It's a conference that strives harder than any I know of to be deeply inclusive to all kinds of people, including queer, trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming folks. It's not perfect, and every year there are new challenges, difficult conversations about how we can create a really inclusive space. It's a powerful experience. And so coming out of a week immersed in that kind of a parallel world, I'm tired, but on a deep level, I'm refreshed. And my reservoir of belief in the possibility of creating better futures has been replenished. But as I stand in the security line and I draw closer to the millimeter wave scanning machine, my stress levels begin to rise. My heartbeat speeds up slightly as I near the end of the line because I know that I'm about to be subject to an embarrassing, even humiliating search by a TSA officer after my body gets flagged as anomalous by the millimeter wave scanner. And I know that that's about to happen because of the particular socio-technical configuration of gender normativity, cis normativity, or the assumption that all people have a gender identity and presentation and body consistent with the sex they're assigned at birth. And that's been built into the scanner through a combination of UI design, scanning technology and sensing, binary gendered body shape data constructs and risk detection algorithms, as well as the socialization, the training and the experience of the TSA agents. So a female presenting TSA agent motions me to step into the scanner. I raise my arms. I place my hands in the triangle shape, palms facing forward above my head. The scanner spins around my body and then the agent signals for me to step forward out of the machine and wait with my feet on the pad just past the scanner exit. And when I glance to my left, I see a screen that displays an abstracted outline of a human body, um, just like I'm showing in the slide here. And as I expected, there's a bright fluorescent yellow block on the diagram highlighting my groin area. Because when I enter the scanner, the TSA operator on the other side is prompted by the UI to select a blue boy button for male or a pink girl button for female. Um, and this is actually what it looks like. But since I'm a non-binary trans feminine person, well, at a distance, usually the operator selects female, but then the three dimensional contours of my body at millimeter resolution differ from the statistical norm of female bodies as understood by the data set, the risk algorithm, the millimeter wave scanner as it's been designed by its subcontractors and as it's been trained by an army of click workers tasked with labeling and classification as scholars like Mary Gray and Billy Irani remind us. So if the agent selects male, my breasts are large enough, statistically speaking, in comparison to a normative male body shape construct to trigger an anomaly warning and a highlight around my chest area, like the figure uh, on the left. And if they select female, my groin area deviates enough from the statistical female norm to trigger the risk alert. I get the bright yellow pixels on my groin area. And so I can't win 
this is a socio-technical system hardwired to mark me as risky. And that's what happens. I get flagged. It escalates to the next level in the security protocol, which is to have an agent physically run their hands over the problem area. And, you know, the TSA policy says that, quote, if a pat down is performed, it will be conducted by an officer of the same gender as you present yourself. But they don't tend to have non-binary trans femme TSA officers on hand. So my problem is not easily resolved by the security protocol. And on this particular day in 2017, I was very unlucky. So one agent strides over and loudly states, I'll do it. And I say, aren't you gonna ask me what I prefer? And he pauses, he moves toward me again. The other agent stops him and asks what I would prefer, but I can't say I'd prefer not to be searched at all. And now I'm standing in public flanked by two TSA agents. There's a line of curious travelers watching the whole interaction. And you know, ultimately they search me and I'm cleared to continue on to my gate. The point of this story is to provide a small but concrete example from my own daily lived experience about how larger systems, including norms, values, and assumptions are encoded in and reproduced through the design of socio-technical systems. Or in political theorist Langdon Winner's famous words, how artifacts have politics. So in this case, Cis normativity is enforced through the scanning technology, the data sets, the risk assessment algorithms, the operator practices, and they're all designed to reproduce the assumption that there are only two genders, that gender presentation conforms with biological sex, and anyone whose body doesn't fall within an acceptable range of deviance is flagged as risky. And subject to a heightened and disproportionate burden of the harms, whether small or potentially large, of airport security systems and the violence of empire that they instantiate. So queer and trans and gender nonconforming people are disproportionately burdened by the design of millimeter wave scanning technology and the way that it's used. It's a system that's biased against us. To use Os Key's term, it's a misgendering machine. And most cisgender people are unaware of all of this. And most trans people know because it directly affects our lives. Of course, these systems aren't only biased against trans and gender nonconforming people, but also against black people who frequently experience invasive searches of their hair as documented by ProPublica, against Sikh men, Muslim women, and others who wear head wraps as described by sociologist Simone Brown in her brilliant book, Dark Matters. As Brown discusses, and as Joy Bulamwini, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, where I also work, technically demonstrates, gender itself is racialized. Humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. So airport security is also systematically biased against many disabled people who are likely to be flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or use prostheses. And anyone who's simultaneously gender non-conforming, black, indigenous, Muslim, immigrant and or disabled are doubly, triply, or multiply burdened by and face the highest risk of harms from the system. So for me, my white skin, US citizenship, and institutional affiliation with MIT put me in a position of relative privilege, right? I'm gonna be spared the most disruptive and harmful possible outcomes of the process. So for example, I don't have to worry that I'm gonna end up placed in a detention center, in deportation proceedings, I'm not going to be hooded and whisked away to Guantanamo Bay or one of the many other secret prisons that form part of the global infrastructure of the so-called war on terror. I probably won't even miss my flight. I'll just be briefly detained for what security expert Bruce Schneier has described as security theater. Other people face much greater potential harms. And here I wanna emphasize that the violent erasure of trans and gender non-conforming people isn't at all new. It's not something that's just based on a particular technology or socio-technical system. It's been happening for hundreds of years under the ongoing project of settler colonialism. Cis normativity was imposed upon indigenous peoples throughout the Americas and around the world through centuries of violence, both spectacular 
like this image of Vasco Nunez de Balboa in 1513, having his dogs devour 40 Terraqua third gender people who he encountered in present day Panama, who he thought were possessed by the devil because he saw them as men in women's clothing. And everyday violence, um, like the smaller instances I've just described. And First Nations Cree two-spirit scholar and activist Harlan Pruden and Nishnabeg theorist and writer Leanne Simpson, among many others, have been systematically recovering these histories. So by grounding an analysis of cis-normative border security systems in hundreds of years of settler colonial violence, I want to make it very clear that I'm not an advocate of a so-called technical solution to the problems of millimeter wave scanners. I'm not asking for them to be less biased or more fair and transparent. I'm not asking to just be included in the data set. I don't want it to just be fixing the anomaly that doesn't get at the underlying historical and structural problems that I'm talking about. Instead, I'm asking us to think about how we can build a world where millimeter wave scanners don't exist, where they, like other border technologies and carceral systems, and the violence has been abolished. So like Harsha Walia, I'm interested in undoing border imperialism. And I'm interested in what Ruha Benjamin in her amazing book, Race After Technology, calls the new Jim Code, discriminatory design that amplifies racial, gender, and other hierarchies through engineered inequity, default discrimination, coded exposure, and techno benevolence. Ruha calls out how technology design so often ignores but thereby replicates social divisions or aims to fix racial bias, but then ultimately reproduces it. So I'm interested in decarceral design, decolonizing design and design justice. Design justice is a framework for analysis of how the design of socio-technical systems influences the distribution of benefits and burdens or harms between various groups of people. And in particular, design justice focuses very explicitly on how design reproduces or challenges the matrix of domination. The matrix of domination is a term developed by black feminist scholar, sociologist and past president of the American Sociological Association, Patricia Hill Collins. And she uses it to refer to race, class and gender as interlocking systems of oppression. So it's a conceptual model that helps us think about how power and oppression, privilege and penalties, benefits, burdens, and harms are systematically distributed. And when she introduced the term in her book, Black Feminist Thought, she emphasized race, class, and gender as three systems that historically have been most important in structuring most Black women's lives. But she notes that we can extend the term to include any and all systems of oppression that mutually constitute each other. And so I think for today, what I'm hoping we can do is talk a little bit about how the matrix of domination relates to one of the core concepts of HCI, affordances. So according to the Interaction Design Foundation, affordances are an object's properties that show how the possible actions users can take with it, suggest how they may interact with that object. So for instance, a button can look as if it needs to be turned or pushed. And affordances was initially developed in the late 1970s by cognitive psychologist, James Gibson, who said that the affordances of the environment are what it offers the animal, what it provides or furnishes either for good or ill. And it came to be influential in many fields following William Gaver's much cited article, Technology Affordances. And then it moved into even wider use in HCI following the publication of cognitive scientist and interface designer, Donald Norman's The Design of Everyday Things. So for Norman, affordance refers to the perceived and actual properties of a thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. So a chair affords sitting, a doorknob affords turning, a mouse affords moving the cursor on the screen and clicking at a particular location, a touch screen affords tapping and swiping, and so on and so forth. The design of everyday things is a canonical text 
It's full of useful insights and compelling examples. But it also almost entirely ignores race, class, gender, disability, and other axes of inequality. Norman does briefly state that capitalism has shaped the design of objects, but he says it in passing and he never relates it to the key concepts in the book. Race and racism appear nowhere. He only uses the term women once in a passage where he describes the amphitheater Louis Laird in the Paris Sorbonne, where, quote, the mural on the ceiling shows lots of naked women floating about a man who's valiantly trying to read a book. Gay, lesbian, trans, none of those terms appear. Disability is barely discussed in a brief section titled Designing for Special People. In that three-page passage, Norman describes the problems designers face in designing for left-handed people, and he urges the reader to, quote, consider the special problems of the aged and infirm, the handicapped, the blind or near blind, the deaf or hard of hearing, the very short or very tall, or the foreign. And so by thinking about it this way, in this book, he's firmly subscribing to the individual or medical model of disability that locates disability and difference in quote, defective bodies and as a problem to be solved rather than the social relational model of disability that recognizes how society actively disables people who have physical or psychological differences, functional limitations or impairments through unnecessary exclusion rather than taking action to meet their access needs. And it's definitely not a disability justice model, which was created by disabled black indigenous and people of color as they fight to dismantle able-bodied supremacy as a key axis of power within the matrix of domination. So design justice is an approach that asks us to focus sustained attention on these kinds of questions, beginning with how does the matrix of domination shape affordance perceptibility and availability? So we might ask whether a given affordance is equally perceptible to all people or whether it systematically privileges some kinds of people over others. Affordance perceptibility is always shaped by standpoint, which is a term for our location within the matrix of domination. So every affordance is going to be more perceptible to some kinds of users than to others. Second, design justice impels us to consider whether a given affordance is equally available to all people. So for example, stairs, which is an example provided by Gaver, afford moving between two levels of a home for many people, but deny that affordance to those whose mode of mobility makes stairs difficult or impossible to use. So for these users, stairs might provide a perceptible but unavailable affordance. An audible alert announcing the arrival of an instant message might enhance perception of the affordances of an IM client for some users. If they're able to hear the alert, if they have the application minimized in the background, those who are away from a computer while engaged in another task, but it offers no perceptual advantages to other users, those who are deaf or hard of hearing or who have their computers muted. So as HCI turns increasingly to interactions based on machines detecting, parsing and predicting human intentions, such as facial recognition, emotion classification or voice control and natural language processing, I think that we need to pause and consider how affordances are never equally perceptible to all and never equally available to all. A given affordance is always more perceptible, more available, or both to certain kinds of people. And design justice calls our ongoing attention to the ways that those differences are shaped by the matrix of domination. So it's asking us to intentionally choose whether we want our work to contribute to dismantling or reproducing inequalities. We could also talk about design disaffordances, which match perceptual cues with actions that will be blocked or constrained. So in a paper about discriminatory design, philosopher of technology D.E. Witkower provides many examples of disaffordances. A fence disaffords entry to a plot of land, a lock on a door disaffords entry without a key, and a fingerprint fingerprint scanner or a face scanner on a mobile phone affords access to the phone's content for the owner while it disaffords access to others. Witkower also identifies disaffordances with a Y, a term he uses for an object that requires some users 
to misidentify themselves to access its functions. For example, as a non-binary person, I experience a disaffordance anytime I interact with a system like air travel ticketing that forces me to select either male or female to proceed. And while a graduate student, Joy Bolomwini experienced the disaffordances of facial detection technology, which failed to detect her dark skinned face until she donned a white mask. And that led her to systematically study bias in facial analysis technology and to found the Algorithmic Justice League. So the point of a design justice analysis isn't to impose a single best design solution, but to recognize that affordances, disaffordances, and disaffordances privilege some people over others and to make those decisions more intentional. I want to add here that empirical studies support a strong critique of the idea that the same design is best for all users. So for example, Reinecke and Bernstein found that most users preferred, preferred a user interface customized according to cultural differences. And they noted that it's not possible to design a single interface that appeals to all users and argue instead for the design of culturally adaptive systems. That's a promising approach, but in practice, unfortunately, it often leads to the reproduction and reification of existing social categories through algorithmic surveillance, tracking users across sites, gathering and selling their data without consent, the development of filter bubbles. So universalization erases difference and produces self-reinforcing spirals of exclusion but personalized and culturally adaptive systems too often are deployed in ways that reinforce surveillance capitalism. Design justice doesn't propose a solution to this paradox. Instead, it urges us to recognize that we constantly make intentional decisions about which users we choose to center and holds us accountable for those choices. Community accountability, control, and ownership of design processes is the topic of chapter two in the book. And I'll also say that I want to emphasize that design justice urges us to explore the ways that technology design relates to domination and resistance at multiple levels, including personal, but also community and in cooperative contexts, as well as at institutional levels. And I don't have time to go level by level today, um, but I, I do do that in the book. And here I wanna to turn to talking about design justice as a community of practice, because this is not a term that I just created. It's not just theory. Instead, it comes out of a growing network. There wouldn't be any design justice theory or practice without design justice network organizers like Yuna Lee, Victoria Barnett, Wes Taylor, Carlos Garcia, Nancy Kalela Motiti, Danielle Albert, Victor Moore, Ebony Dumas, and many, many others. It's a community made up of design practitioners who work with social movements and community-based organizations across the United States and around the world. And there's also a lot of other overlapping communities of practice that are doing this work or similar work besides the Design Justice Network itself. Like there's the De Decolonizing Design Group, there's uh, Data Feminists, there's Afrofuturist speculative design like Alondra Nelson's work, there's Pluriversal Designers like Arturo Escobar, and so many more. But this book and my own experience really comes out of the Design Justice Network, which was born at the Allied Media Conference in the summer of 2015. And a group of 30 designers and artists, technologists and planners, architects and community organizers took part in a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice. And I don't have time to go into all of the background, but you know this was a workshop inspired by a lot of pre-existing um, work and by other principles. The goal was to challenge or move beyond um, the frame of social impact design or design for good, and to think about how good intentions are not always enough to ensure that design processes can become tools for liberation. And so we developed principles in that workshop um, based on asking really a simple set of questions about who was involved in your design process, who was harmed and who benefited the most. Um, and we developed those principles, reworked them over the next couple of years, 
and launch them uh, in 2018 in the following form. So these are the current version of the Design Justice Network principles. Principle one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Principle two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. And three, we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer. Principle four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process, not only a point at the end of a process. Principle five, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. There are 10 of these. Principle six, we believe that everyone's an expert based on their own lived experience, and that we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to a design process. Principle seven, we share design knowledge and tools with our communities. Eight, we work towards sustainable community-led and controlled outcomes, because too often we saw sort of parachute approaches to design processes where a well-intentioned designer drops into a community and develops something that might be interesting, but it's not sustained uh, in that community. Principle nine, we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional indigenous, diasporic and local knowledge and practices. So since the principles were launched, the Design Justice Network has been growing rapidly, nurtured by many different people. There are now more than 1200 signatories to these principles. There are more than 300 members of the network who commit monthly time or dues uh, to support the network's growth. There are local nodes that are self-organizing in cities around the United States and around the world. There are regular network gatherings and tracks at the AMC, workshops and talks, there's a steering committee that includes uh, Yuna Lee, Wesley Taylor, Denise Shante Brown, and myself. And there's a network coordinator, uh, Victoria Barnett. Um, there's, there's a zine series that people are producing that structures our work, like um, the how to create a local node of the Design Justice Network zine. Um, there are talks happening uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a rapidly growing network um, there's a lot of really interesting um, developments taking place and um, I don't have time to go into it, but I, I encourage you to join the network and you can learn more at designjustice.org. And again, I wanna emphasize that there are so many people doing work in this space. It's not just the Design Justice Network itself. So there is the Creative Reaction Lab led by Antoinette Carol developed the equity-centered community design framework. There are, uh, there's a growing sort of network called Design as Protest, who in the midst of the global pandemic and the surging movement for black liberation, uh, organized a series of calls, national conference calls with hundreds of participants and released a set of design justice demands for architects and city planners and those working on the built environment. And of course, in computing, there is just a flood of excellent recent work that is explicitly rethinking computing through black, queer, feminist, anarchist, green, and other strands of liberatory thought and practice. And that has roots both in the academy and in the key social movements of our time. Um, I could highlight so many different, you know, so much work, but. Um, I would mention here the Consentful Tech Group who are taking lessons um, from sexual consent uh, and applying it to how to do technology development. So technology should be fries, right? It should be 
Um, when we share data, it should be freely given, reversible, um, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. And that's a framework that comes from thinking about consent culture um, in uh, human you know, sexual and relationship interactions. And we could think about what that would mean for developed technologies that followed that approach. Um, I'm a co-author of a recent report called More Than Code, um, which is about the growing field of public interest technology and a new report that's just about to come out called Pathways Through the Portal, um, together with Civic Hall, with Diana Nusera and Burhan Tai, Matt Stempek and Mika Sifri from, from Civic Hall, where we interviewed practitioners of AI in the public interest and other emerging technologies. Um, and we'll share more about that uh, pretty soon. Um, we could also think about the Fat Star community, right, that emerged starting in 2014 as a key hub for a, a certain type of work, which is about thinking about how AI and algorithmic decision support systems may reproduce bias. And it's rapidly become a very prominent space for computer scientists to advance research about algorithmic bias. You know, what does that mean? How do we measure it? How do we model it? How do we reduce it? And so papers about algorithmic bias are now regularly published in mainstream HCI journals and conferences. And that's all really crucial and important work. Although I will say that design justice uh, involves a critique of the idea of fairness as the end goal, mathematical fairness. And Anna Lauren Hoffman has recently done a great paper uh, on the limits of anti-discrimination discourse um, that I encourage people to check out. I mentioned race after technology already, uh, Ruha Benjamin's work, but a little bit more about that. So in that book, she develops the term, the new Jim code to highlight the ways that algorithmic decision systems based on historical data sets reinforce white supremacy and discrimination, even as their designers position them as fair in the colorblind sense. So racial hierarchies can only be dismantled by actively anti-racist systems design, not by pretending they don't exist. And Ruha teaches us that we should challenge the underlying assumption that our ultimate goal in algorithm design is symmetrical treatment. Instead, we need to discuss the difference between algorithmic color blindness, I don't see race, right? And algorithmic justice. We could look at the work of Sophia Noble, who in her work, Algorithms of Oppression, focuses our attention on the ways that search algorithms misrepresent marginalized subjects, beginning with her own experience of the circulation of hypersexualized images of black girls and women or what Patricia Hill Collins called controlling images. We could look at work by Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri in their book, Ghost Work, where they're focusing on labor and inequality and thinking about how the seemingly smooth user experience of AI powered services actually depends on the work of a huge invisibilized human labor force. We could look at Virginia Eubanks work on automating inequality where she's unpacking how algorithmic decision support systems punish poor people. And they were implemented as a right-wing strategy to limit and roll back hard fought access to social welfare programs that were originally won by organized poor people's movement. And we could, um, there's so many more, but you know, I wanna leave a little bit of time for Q and A here. Um, so I guess I would also say that, you know, I'll highlight the Algorithmic Justice League as well. Um, where Joy Bulamwini and now a growing group of, of people, including myself, are arguing that we must develop intersectional training data, tests, and benchmarks for machine learning systems. But although Bulamwini is best known for demonstrating that facial analysis software performs worst on women with darker skin tones, she's also advocating not only for inclusion, but also for greatly increased public oversight. So she says, quote, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation. If you have a voice, you should have a choice. And these analyses aren't only taking place inside the academy. We could look at the tech won't build it movement, um, you know, Googlers who've been mobilizing um, against Project Maven, um, against transphobia, um, you know, on YouTube, against uh, sexual harassment and discrimination, both inside the workplace culture, um, but also in product design. We could talk about the Carceral Tech Resistance Network, which you can learn more about at carceral.tech, 
the Our Data Bodies project, looking at uh, surveillance practices in Detroit and elsewhere. The No Tech for ICE campaign led by Mi Gente that's got people refusing recruiters from Palantir and Andoril and other um, tech companies that are focused on building the detention and deportation and family separation system that I started the talk with. There are so many um, organizations, both inside and outside the academy, that are developing um, you know, this type of work. So I, I began this talk by noting that there's a sea change taking place. Uh, here at uh, CSCW 2020 workshop on collective organizing and social responsibility, just this week, Danny Spitzberg, Kevin Shaw, Colin Angevine, Marissa Wilkins, M. Strickland, Janelle Yamashiro, Rhonda Adams, and Leah Lockhart presented a paper called Principles at Work, Applying Design Justice in Professionalized Workplaces. So the design justice principles and network are now moving into a number of different sp spaces, including CSCW. I also think that there are, you know, it's been interesting to look at the talks this week at WIST, and there have been a number of talks focused on accessibility. So for example, the Rescribe talk by uh, Amy Pavel, Gabriel Reyes, and Jeffrey uh, Bigham, they sought feedback on the effectiveness of their audio description tool through interviews with blind and visually impaired audio description users. And that's a really important example of the idea of design justice and the disability rights principle of nothing about us without us. So as we move to design systems with people who are potentially uh, you know, typically excluded or potentially most harmed by systems design, um, they need to be at the table. And I'll just end by saying, you know, in this year's WIST vision talk, Steve Hodges at Microsoft Research urged us to imagine democratizing the production of interactive hardware. And he said that he hopes that, quote, small companies will be able to manage a portfolio of niche but viable hardware services addressing the minority needs of individuals and communities. And I definitely agree with that idea of democratizing the production of hardware. But I think that our vision also needs to shift from thinking about the minority needs of niche communities to thinking about how design from the margins, design that centers people who are marginalized within the matrix of domination can both make our products more accessible and also serve the interests of making the world more just, our processes more just, and also developing um, ecological sustainability in a world that's rapidly warming and in crisis. So we're living in a time of great transformation. The questions that design justice asks us to consider are really difficult, but deeply necessary questions. And I hope that we'll all continue to ask them of ourselves and of one another in the years and decades to come. Thank you. And now let's open it up for the Q&A. Shamsi, I think you're muted still. I think I've done that every single time I've come online. I can. <laughs> Clearly not doing this enough. So I just want to thank you. That was an amazing talk, extremely uh, thought provoking and I am uh, continuing to digest it myself. I want to remind our audience to please be submitting questions in the Discord server. We've got someone uh, monitoring there and helping to vote things up. So, and then I am bringing those questions and some of our own from the panelist group to, to Sasha to ask now. So uh, I wanted to start by talking about our young researchers, which I think is one of the places this kind of new thinking is gonna make the biggest difference. Our young researchers come from many different backgrounds, different countries and different cultures. How can we create a broad perspective that helps them understand and embrace awareness of design justice, inclusivity beyond their worldview? Yeah, I think that's really a, a great question. Um, you know, a lot of the examples that I've been drawing from in the Design Justice book um, come from my own experience in the US. Um, and I think that what's happening now is we're seeing the local nodes of the Design Justice Network 
start to form. So there are local nodes in more than um, 10 cities now. Um, there's a local node in Singapore. There's a Mediterranean node that gathers some people from, uh, from Spain, from Italy, uh, from Morocco. Um, and so I think that you know, these principles may not be the perfect principles. This is a living document, of course. But as the network starts to grow and as people are meeting to think about what these principles mean in practice in their own local context, um, you know, that's, that's where it starts to become really, really useful. Not just as sort of an abstraction, but in terms of what does this mean in day-to-day -day work in different geographic contexts, in different social contexts, and within different fields as well. So I think part of what you're saying is uh, you need to practice it and you need to be doing it surrounded by people who are like-minded, that these, these are ways you can start to reinforce and understand and explore the ideas. Is that uh, absolutely consistent yeah. with what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so, so, so the community here is very important, the design community. Uh, by the way, that question came from uh, co-chair uh, Shamsi Iqbal. Um, I'm going to ask you if you could uh, dig, well, I want to follow up on that one, actually. So as, as you may have noticed, the WISC community is not historically very diverse by gender, race, or most of the groups. Participation at the junior researcher, particularly students, is low in terms of diversity. When we went through the, uh, we, we have a lot of uh, women on the organization committee were actively outreaching at the leadership levels. But uh, the student authors that you see in the presenters in the demo sessions are still not so diverse. And how would you advise us as a community to turn that around? How, how, do, we, how do we engage and change the makeup of the people who are actually doing the design in this highly technical field? I mean, I think on the one hand, of course, this isn't, this isn't a problem just of WIST, this is a, society-wide problem that responds to literally centuries of unequal practices around you know, gender and race and ethnicity and disability. And so we can't expect any one professional association to be able to solve those things. Mm -hmm. That said, I also believe that there is just such an explosion of phenomenal work coming from younger uh, scholars who, are, um, who occupy many different standpoints uh, that have historically been pushed to the margin. So younger scholars who are women or are trans or non-binary folks who are black, indigenous, people of color who identify as disabled or having a disability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of great work happening. And so there's this question of how to find and encourage and connect with and draw people in. And the good news there, I think, is also that there's plenty of great research uh, and practice and best practices that's out there, both from you know, the corporate sector, from the diversity, equity, and inclusion literature, um, as well as from, you know, from universities that kind of signals, here's a bunch of things that you need to do. So um, it's not like we're starting from scratch. Um, there's lots of great advice around, well, how do you set up the right reward structures? How do you ensure that there's mentorship in place? Um, how do you do outreach in places that you may not have considered doing outreach in? So for example, you know, are we you know, systematically approaching um, historically black colleges and universities to see where there might be you know, younger scholars um, doing relevant work um, who might wanna come to the conference if they knew about it um, and were, you know, resource to attend. Um, I think the shift to virtual, you know, it has both benefits and disadvantages. Uh, one of the benefits is that, you know, transportation and lodging costs are really a high barrier, especially for a lot of younger scholars. And so, um, you know, that, that is definitely reduced for a lot of people to be able to participate in a virtual space. So there's a lot we can do. There's a lot we know about how to um, build diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts correctly. Um, and I think it takes, it takes an institutional commitment. Um, we know that setting public uh, goals for in, in, inclusive participation and setting target sort of deadlines helps. So we could say, we want WIST to reach gender parity by 2025 or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
and maybe that's already been done, but I think that there's, there's a lot of um, sort of clear signposts for what, what the community can yeah. do. So, so uh, a question from Jen Mankoff, one of, one of the senior women members of the WISC community, in fact, uh, who's very engaged in these issues has a question that's a great follow-up to what you've been asking. She says, how can we encourage and train our students at all levels to access the ethical implications of technology? How do we respond to those who believe it is not their responsibility to predict the future and thus that it is not the right thing for them to do? I can read uh, it again. <laughs> no, I think I got it. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I have a couple of different kinds of answers to this question. One is, you know, as an educator myself, you know, what I attempted to do, um, you know, at MIT was I created a space called the co-design studio, um, which was um, really a, a pedagogical space for students at different levels, undergrad, graduate, um, to get some experience with what it means to do participatory design work. Um, and I tried to provide a bunch of scaffolding for that to happen um, because it's my belief that, um, you know, reading about ethical principles and looking at case studies is really important, um, but can only take us so far. I think that people need to gain um, some concrete experience, experience with support um, from faculty you know, mentors um, in what it means to do design and technology development work together with a community partner. And so I'm, I explore my experience in that in a, in a chapter about pedagogy in the book. So I encourage you know, people to look at that further. But to me, I think some of the key takeaways that I had was that um, you know, sometimes students already came with a critical analysis and a connection to some type of community organization or social movement group. And I would work with them to develop a shared technology design project together. And sometimes they came without any of that, but a desire and an openness to learn. And so I would provide some scaffolding in terms of bringing some of my own relationships with community-based organizations um, to create a space um, where people could do some of that learning. And that means, you know, physically spending time with the community-based organization to learn more about the every, you know, the day-to-day -day needs and desires and, um, and assets that the, the community has and figuring out how to leverage their own skills um, to amplify or support some type of ongoing community process instead of taking a sort of tech savior approach. And I think that that's been really valuable for a lot of the students that I've worked with. Thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, push also on what I think was uh, what she might have been, Jen might have been focusing on the second part of her question, which uh, might speak also to our colleagues, not just what we do in our own classrooms and with our own students, but also uh, those of us, uh, many of us are, are uh, university professors, for example, who have uh, working in technical departments, like I'm in a department of computer science. And so is Jen. And our colleagues, when we're trying to do department-wide uh, curriculum design, might say, this is not our job. We shouldn't be designing curriculum in this way. And so it tends to get pushed into the HCI curriculum in a computer science department, for example. Uh, and what, what could you offer us as advice to talk to those colleagues to convince them that this needs to be embedded throughout all of our teaching? Mm. That is a great question. I mean, I think now's a moment when we're having really a huge society-wide conversation about the unintended harms of mm -hmm. computing systems that we've built. Um, I don't always love the framing, um, but you know, for example, the, the film, The Social Dilemma has generated a big conversation about the, it frames it as the addictive nature of uh, social media. I think there's a lot of problems with the framing. Um, but it's something that people recognize. The election provides us with a moment to talk about um, you know, the implications for democracy of computing systems that were uh, built and developed uh, without an eye to the long-term you know, social and political implications. Um, I think you can use an argument from, from industry, right? Which is, um, one is reputational harms. So if, you're, if students are gonna be going out and working in industry, um, then, if they don't learn about how uh, ignoring race and gender and other types of bias um, in the development of computing systems reproduces those inequalities, you know, if they don't know about that, they're gonna build these things and that's gonna cause problems for the firms. 
they're going to have reputational harm, even mm -hmm. if even if that's all they care about, you know, it's going to be bad for them. Um, and if they're firms that are sensibly well-meaning firms, or if they're triple bottom line firms and care about social and environmental impacts, um, it will it will damage them. And frankly, even if there are firms that don't care about that stuff at all, um, these these things expose them to lawsuits, um, yes. reputational damage, and to class action suits and to antitrust um, actions, as we're seeing increasingly uh, in the case of the of the big tech companies. So, you know. Um, when you build your whole business model on ignoring the ways that you're reproducing existing forms of inequality around uh, class, race, and gender, um, it tends to, after some period of time, start to come back to bite you, as Uber and Lyft are seeing in California now with the you know classification of, of drivers as workers, or um, as firm after firm is seeing with the pushback against the deployment of facial recognition technology by police, as municipalities start to ban that um, as federal legislation has been introduced to ban it. We've seen you know, um, many of the top providers, Amazon, Microsoft, and so on, uh, at least call for a temporary pause uh, on, on sales of these tools uh, to, to law enforcement uh, because they understand that the harms that it might produce and the way that it looks for the company and the lawsuits it might uh, involve them in later. Yep. That, that's that's very helpful and the idea of reputational harm and also creating students that are going to be sought out, uh, sought after in industry for these reasons because they have this broad training might be a very powerful argument to our colleagues. Um, I'm mindful of the time. I think we have time for maybe one one more substantive question, substantive answer like this. Uh, particularly, this is coming from Jasmine Liu in, at University of Chicago particularly in research of emerging technology, the values driving innovation often come from those of academic institutions, big tech companies, and or military. Do you think we can diversify the values driving innovation beyond these, and how can we? Is it about including more diverse communities, or is there more we can do? So I think this kind of relates to what you were talking about, um, but how, how can we push back against those values? I think that is a really excellent question. That's absolutely true. Um, and since we only have a couple more minutes, and given the moment that we're at in history, I would just point to, I would just point to the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the way that the values that technology development processes respond to are set is actually through public policy. So, you know, what what are nation states going to invest in? Um, the the research programs, you know, that come from an NSF or from the Department of Defense. Um, dramatically shape, uh, you know, funding that makes available, you know, that, that develops labs, that hires students, and so on and so forth. And so I think to influence that, um, one of the most important strategies is to vote and to ensure that elected officials who have a lot of power over uh, where the research funding is going to be uh, focused and deployed, um, you know, better reflect the changing values of uh, rapidly diversifying uh, populace, both here in the United States, but also increasingly everywhere. Um, so people have to become involved in the political process because there's only so much you can do at the individual level in the products that you're developing and designing your own research agenda, or even at the, you know, the small group level of the institution or a professional association. At some level, a lot of this stuff is, you know, shaped um, above that, and we do have mechanisms to help influence that, and we need to participate in them. So vote, <laughs> vote, vote, and, and vote and speak up. And as a scientist, don't be afraid to use your voice, uh, because uh, that's how we can take a leadership role here. Thank you so much, Sasha. There are more questions, and I think more questions may come. Uh, there's so much to digest here that I think people uh, are still are still finding their way through their thoughts about it. I encourage, uh, if, if Sasha, you were going to tell us if you feel able to go and look on our. I, I don't think you've actually discovered our Discord server yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which, which which does take a learning curve for some people, but it's been a quite quite the experience over this uh, conference to have people learn how to use it and be successful there. But if you were comfortable with that, uh, there are people there on the server now who would love to keep on talking to you after the conference is over. So 
completely. I would like to add that there has been a lot of applause going on uh, in the Discord server. Uh, I mean, if this was a real talk, this was the time when you would get the thunderous applause. So um, <laughs> I would, I'm really happy to hear this talk. And I think that we all learned a lot. And from Karen and I, we would like to thank you very much for making the time to talk to us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And drop me a link to the Discord server. I have to eat something and then I'll pop over in there for a few minutes. Thank you.